friends. Welcome to Ents and Sensibility, the podcast for everyone who loves bold, witty women, awkward, handsome men, and dragons. I'm your host, Casey Meserve. Well, it's been quite a while since our last episode, and we have some really interesting things happening. In Austin News Today, Fire Island is making waves on streaming services. This rom-com follows Noah, Howie, and their ridiculous friends on their annual excursion to the gay vacation spot off the southern coast of Long Island, New York. While they're there, they meet Charlie and Will. This hilarious show is a loving tribute to Pride and Prejudice, but more than that, as I've begun learning more about queer culture, this movie rips apart some of the myths about the type the island has catered to. That is rich, white, cis males. Noah, Howie, and the gang are neither rich nor white, and their so-called house mom, Erin, played by Margaret Cho, is the lesbian Mrs. Bennett we all wish the character was, but never thought to ask for. Charlie is the floppy-haired cinnamon roll we all want in a Bingley, and Will is as standoffish as the best on-screen Darcy's. I love this movie, and I laughed my ass off during some of the scenes. Now, this movie is not for under 17s, we'll say. There are some, we'll say, explicit scenes, which certainly could have been more explicit, but we'll leave it at that. While in some ways, I think retellings of Austin's stories can be limiting to storytellers, I hope that the popularity of stories like Fire Island will encourage production companies to create new and unique stories and unique queer stories about friendship and romance. Happy Pride Month to all my LGBTQ plus folks out there. Speaking of retellings, Netflix dropped their first trailer for Persuasion in mid-June, and I am here for the smoldering looks from Cosmo Jarvis's Captain Wentworth. We see a lot of loose flowing hair and wine-drunk bathtub cries by Dakota Fanning as a surprisingly emotional Anne Elliot. But I think the scene stealer is going to be Richard E. Grant as Sir Walter. If you follow book hoarding on social media, you'll have the amazing image of Sir Walter surrounded by about a dozen images of himself. And it is ridiculous, and I cannot wait to see the newest version of Persuasion. And before we get started on today's chapter, I do have a small correction to make. In our last episode, I said Jane, her sister Cassandra, and their mother moved to Chaunton when their brother, Edward, invited them to live at the cottage near Godmersham Park. Well, Chaunton is not anywhere near Godmersham. The cottage was near one of Edward's other manor estates, because he had a few, uh, namely Chaunton House. In our last episode, we read Chapter 11 of Sense and Sensibility. Marianne and Willoughby are practically joined at the hip, and Eleanor got to know Colonel Brandon better. Today, we'll join Eleanor and Marianne as they take a morning walk. As Eleanor and Marianne were walking together the next morning, the latter communicated a piece of news to her sister, which, in spite of all that she knew before of Marianne's imprudence and want of thought, surprised her by its extravagant testimony of both. Marianne told her, with the greatest delight, that Willoughby had given her a, a horse, one that he had bred himself on his estate in Somersetshire, and which was exactly calculated to carry a woman. And skipping a bit, he intends to send his groom into Somersetshire immediately for it, she added, and when it arrives we will ride every day. You shall share its use with me. Imagine to yourself, my dear Eleanor, the delights of a gallop over some of these downs. Now, I was a horse-mad kid. I would have been over the moon if somebody gave me a horse, and not even Eleanor's very sensible arguments could have convinced me not to keep it. 
And Eleanor is flabbergasted that Marian accepted a horse as a gift without any thought about what its cost would do to their mother. And Eleanor knows that their mother would let Marian keep it. We've discussed Mrs. D's financial straits before. She's not poor, but compared to what she had enjoyed before her husband died, she's not well off. Referencing back to The Complete Servant by Samuel and Sarah Adams, an adult male groom would earn between 22 and 25 pounds a year. And if he's, it's always a man, is caring for two or more horses, he may have a boy to help him. So that's a servant to care for the horses and ride one with Marianne, plus a boy to help, plus a stable for both horses, plus food, and any potential care bills for both horses. Mrs. D already has two maids and a manservant and is definitely at her budget's breaking point. And Eleanor points out all these financial issues to Marianne, but her sister just brushes it all off. As to an additional servant, the expense would be a trifle. Mama, she was sure, would never object to it, and any horse would do for him. He might always get one at the park. As to a stable, the merest shed would be sufficient. It all seems so simple to marry in. Except a horse bred to carry a lady will definitely outpace any horse that Mrs. D could afford for her groom. Not to mention they now live in Devonshire, the rainiest county in England. So that horse would need a warm stable to keep out the rain and not just any shed would do. Eleanor then ventured to doubt the propriety of her receiving such a present from a man so little, or at least so lately, known to her. This was too much. "'You are mistaken, Eleanor,' she said warmly, "'in supposing I know very little of Willoughby. I have not known him long indeed, but I am much better acquainted with him than I am with any other creature in the world, except yourself and Mamma. It is not time or opportunity that is to determine intimacy. It is disposition alone. Seven years would be insufficient to make some people acquainted with each other, and seven days are more than enough for others. I should hold myself guilty of greater impropriety in accepting a horse from my brother than from Willoughby. Of John I know very little, though we have lived together for years. But of Willoughby my judgment has long been formed. Well, Marianne's got a point. You can know someone for years and never know them well. Well, you can have an immediate connection with someone and begin a lifelong relationship. And it's also a trope of sentimental novels that characters become instant best friends or fall in love at first sight. Jane actually spoofed this in a lot of her juvenalia. In her epistolary story, Love and Friendship, the narrator Laura falls in love at first sight and marries Edward on the same day by her father who was bred for the church but was never actually ordained. Two chapters later, she becomes instant best friends with Sophia, the wife of Edward's best friend. And Laura describes Sophia thusly. She was all sensibility and feeling. We flew into each other's arms and after having exchanged vows of mutual friendship for the rest of our lives, instantly unfolded to each other the most inward secrets of our hearts. We were interrupted in this delightful employment by the entrance of Augustus, Edward's friend, who was just returned from a solitary ramble. Never did I see such an affecting scene as was the meeting of Edward and Augustus. My life, my soul, exclaimed the former. My adorable angel, replied the latter, as they flew into each other's arms. It was too pathetic for the feelings of Sophia and myself, and we fainted alternately on a sofa. Eleanor, of course, is so very sensible that she believes only long acquaintance, like years, or at least months in Edward's case, could lead to knowing another person. But she's smart enough not to touch this nerve. She knew her sister's temperament. Opposition on so tender a subject would only attach her the more to her own opinion. But by an appeal to her affection for her mother, by representing the inconveniences which that indulgent mother must draw on herself, as would probably be the case, she consented to this increase of establishment. When logic won't work, use guilt. 
like every mother has ever done. Think of how this financial burden would strain Mama. Think of how inconvenient it would be for her. She has so many other things she would like to do with the house. But Mama wouldn't be able to refurbish the drawing room or add those rooms like she wanted to because she has to pay for the servant and build a stable. So option C works. Marianne was shortly subdued, and she promised not to tempt her mother to such imprudent kindness by mentioning the offer, and to tell Willoughby when she saw him next that it must be declined. One positive trait about Marianne is she's truthful. She was faithful to her word, and when Willoughby called at the cottage the same day, Eleanor heard her express her disappointment to him in a low voice, on being obliged to forgo the acceptance of his present. The reason for this alteration were at the same time related, and they were such as to make further entreaty on his side impossible. His concern, however, was very apparent, and after expressing it with earnestness, he added, in the same low voice, But Marianne, the horse is still yours, though you cannot use it now. I shall keep it only till you can claim it. When you leave Barton to form your own establishment in a more lasting home, Queen Mab shall receive you. There's a lot in this one paragraph, so let's take some time to unpack it all. First of all, Willoughby uses Marianne's first name. That's a big deal. It really denotes an intimacy. And usually a man in Georgian England wouldn't use a lady's first name until after he proposed. Some married couples used Mr. and Mrs. to refer to each other all their lives. And second, Willoughby says the horse is still Marianne's, even though she can't keep it now. He says it will be hers once she establishes her own home. Basically, when she gets married and moves into her husband's home, she can take the horse. This is not a subtle hint that if they're not engaged yet, they intend to become so. Okay, before we go on, humor me, because this grown-up horse girl needs to look at the horse's name. Queen Mab is a reference to Romeo and Juliet. Queen Mab was the name of the fairy's midwife in Act 1, Scene 4. Now, in this scene, Romeo and Mercutio are gatecrashing a masquerade hosted by the Capulets. That's Juliet's parents. Romeo is mooning over Rosalind, a woman he's only seen from afar who he's never spoken to and who doesn't know he exists. And he and his friends are going to this party because they know she'll be there. As they approach the gate, Romeo says he had a dream the night before, telling him that going to this dance was a bad idea. But Mercutio says he's being tricked by Queen Mab, the fairy's midwife. She gallops night by night through lovers' brains and then they dream of love, of courtiers' knees that dream of curtsies straight, or lawyers' fingers whose straight dreams on fees, or a lady's lips who straight on kisses dream which off the angry Mab with blisters plague, because their breath with sweetmeats tainted are. Sometimes she gallops over a courtier's nose, and then dreams he of smelling out a suit, and sometimes comes she with a tithe pig's tail, tickling a parson's nose as he lies asleep. Then he dreams of another benefice. Sometimes she driveth o'er a soldier's neck, and then dreams of cutting foreign throats, or breeches, embuscados, Spanish blades, of healths five fathoms deep, and then anon drums in his ear, at which he starts and wakes, and, being thus frightened, swears a prayer or two and sleeps again. This is that very Mab, that plats the manes of horses in the night, and bakes the elf locks in foul sluttish hairs, which once untangles much misfortune's bodes, this is the hag, when maids lie on their backs, that presses them and learns them to bear, making them women of good carriage. Queen Mab is a fairy who rides her chariot across lovers' brains to create magical dreams when she's in a good mood, and if she's in a bad mood, she'll give you a venereal disease. But Mercutio says these dreams are begot of nothing but fantasy, and are more inconstant than the wind, just as Marianne's dreams of owning the horse can never come true, and her Willoughby will prove a mercurial and inconstant lover. 
So in the play, Queen Mab underlines Romeo's immaturity in relationships, which is typical of teenage boys. And we see him face experiences that force him to grow up quickly before you, like, he kills himself. So naming a horse after a vindictive fairy that gives you fantasies or venereal diseases and enforces the idea of immaturity is definitely something a man of sensibilities would do to please a young lady. And one more thought. I think Queen Mab's name is foreshadowing a lot of the action we see later in the novel about this dream of Willoughby Marianne is having. He's a, a dream horse that becomes a nightmare. Okay, back to the story. Now, Eleanor overhears Marianne and Willoughby's very intimate conversation, and she finally decides they really are serious. She instantly saw an intimacy so decided, a meaning so direct, as marked a perfect agreement between them. From that moment, she doubted not of their being engaged to each other, and the belief of it created no other surprise than that she, or any of their friends, should be left by temper so frank to discover it by accident. Eleanor is surprised that this is something that they discovered by accident, that Marianne and Willoughby didn't just blurt it out and tell everybody because that's the type of people they are, or that's the type of people Eleanor believes they are. And unusually for Eleanor, she decides this instantly. Miss Sensible very suddenly changes her mind with this circumstantial evidence. But what really got Eleanor believing was Willoughby calling Marianne by her first name. That just wasn't done in Georgian society. This is some serious intimacy. Also, is this is she snooping? Or is the house just so small that she can overhear everything? Or do Marianne and Willoughby simply not care that they're being overheard? I think it might be the latter because later that night... Margaret discovers more evidence, and she shares it with Eleanor the next day. Oh, Eleanor, she cried, I have such a secret to tell you about Marianne. I am sure she will be married to Mr. Willoughby very soon. You have said so, replied Eleanor, almost every day since they first met on High Church Down, and they had not known each other a week, I believe, before you were certain that Marianne wore his picture around her neck, but it turned out to only be the miniature of our great uncle. But indeed, this is quite another thing. I am sure they will be married very soon, for he has got a lock of her hair. Take care, Margaret. It may only be the hair of some great uncle of his. But indeed, Eleanor, it is Marianne's. I am almost sure of it, for I saw him cut it off. Last night after tea, when you and Mamma went out of the room, they were whispering and talking together as fast as could be, and he seemed to be begging something of her, and presently he took up her scissors and cut off a long lock of her hair, for it was all tumbled down her back, and he kissed it and folded it up in a piece of white paper and put it in his pocketbook. So Margaret says she believes Marianne and Willoughby are engaged, but Eleanor kind of dismisses it at first, even though she saw evidence just the day before. She says Margaret has been saying this since the day Marianne and Willoughby met. High Church Down is the name of the hill Marianne fell down in the rain a few episodes back. But Margaret says she's got proof, and then she tells the story about Willoughby asking Marianne for a lock of hair, and Marianne consenting to him actually cutting off one of her locks. And this story is lining up with Eleanor's previous deductions. Why? Because a lock of hair was a memento of love. Now, it could represent familiar love or romantic love, which is why Eleanor initially says it might be from Willoughby's uncle. Now, there are two forms of mementos mentioned here. The miniature portrait of the Dashwood's uncle, with whom they lived for so many years, and then whom chose to give their brother all of his inheritance, leaving them with nothing. But at least Marianne's not bitter. And then there is the lock of hair. And in this scene, Margaret describes Marianne is wearing her hair loose, which is another symbol Austin is using for Marianne's sensibilities. 
women in the Georgian period were moving away from from powdered hair or wigs and beginning to wear it in styles inspired by Greek art in ringlets or braids. And while it was much simpler than these enormous powder dues of older women, it was still held up, usually off the neck. Women wore their hair up and controlled in order to quell male lust. And a woman wouldn't generally take down her hair until she was getting ready for bed. To wear her hair long in front of a single man has some really heavy sexual undertones. So these gifts, the horse and the hair, are both symbols of sexual desire. Willoughby is dreaming of Marianne riding Queen Mab while she, while he begs her for a lock of hair. And he cuts her hair, he kisses it, implying sexual desire again, and folds it into his pocketbook, which in addition to being an actual small book for memoranda could also hold money. And this is another way of connecting marriage and courtship with financial game. This isn't just a courtship. Marianne and Willoughby are in what could potentially be a sexual relationship. Eleanor may or may not understand these undertones, but she definitely understands the intimacy of both of these gifts. For such particulars, stated on such authority, Eleanor could not withhold her credit, nor was she disposed to it, for the circumstance was in perfect unison with what she had heard and seen herself. Eleanor now believes, as Mrs. D and Margaret do, that Marion and Willoughby must be engaged to speak to each other and give gifts that are so intimate. But young Margaret isn't done talking about relationships, because the very next night, Margaret's sagacity was not always displayed in such a way so satisfactory to her sister. When Mrs. Jennings attacked her one evening at the park to give the name of the young man who was Eleanor's particular favorite, which had been long a matter of great curiosity to her, Margaret answered by looking at her sister and saying, I must not tell, may I, Eleanor? This, of course, made everybody laugh, and Eleanor tried to laugh too, but the effort was painful. She was convinced that Margaret had fixed on a person whose name she could not bear with composure to become a standing joke with Mrs. Jennings. Marianne felt for her most sincerely, but she did more harm than good to the cause by turning very red and saying in an angry manner to Margaret, Remember that whatever your conjectures may be, you have no right to repeat them. I never had any conjectures about it, replied Margaret. It was you who told me of it yourself. This increased the mirth of the company, and Margaret was eagerly pressed to say something more. Oh, pray, Miss Margaret, let us know all about it, said Mrs. Jennings. What is the gentleman's name? I must not tell, ma'am, but I know very well what it is, and I know where he is, too. Yes, yes, we can guess where he is. At his own house at Norland, to be sure. He is the curate of the parish, I dare say. No, that he is not. He is of no profession at all. Margaret, said Marian, with great warmth, you know that all this is an invention of your own, and that there is no such person in existence. Well, then, he is lately dead, Marian, for I am sure that there was such a man once, and his name begins with an F. Most grateful did Eleanor feel to Lady Middleton for observing at this moment that it rained very hard, though she believed that the interruption to proceed less from any attention to her than from her ladyship's great dislike for all such inelegant subjects, than from her ladyship's great dislike of all such inelegant subjects of raillery, as delighted her husband and mother. The idea, however, started by her, was immediately pursued by Colonel Brandon, who was on every occasion mindful of the feelings of others, and much was said on the subject of rain by both of them. Willoughby opened the pianoforte and asked Marianne to sit down to it, and thus amidst the various endeavors of different people to quit the topic, it fell to the ground. But not so easily did Eleanor recover from the alarm into which it had thrown her. Poor Eleanor, she is mortified by her sister's behavior, 
And it's not even the sister that we expect. It's the baby. She's not one to ever talk about a love interest. But now her sisters have done it for her. First, Margaret for blabbing, and then Marianne for trying to protect Eleanor and just making it worse. Thankfully, reliably dull Lady Middleton changes the subject, and Colonel Brandon, being the gentleman he is, actually engages Lady M in the topic in order to shake Mrs. Jennings from pestering Eleanor. So now everyone thinks both Marianne and Eleanor must be engaged. We, the reader, know Eleanor isn't. She and F, that's Edward Ferris, never made any plans beyond friendship. And, as we saw back in episode four, Eleanor denied everything beyond simply esteeming Edward when her mother and Marianne were practically planning her wedding. I do not attempt, said she, that I think very highly of him, that I greatly esteem him, that I like him. And Eleanor hasn't even heard from Edward, or at least we the reader haven't been privy to any letters from him since they moved to Devonshire. So while Eleanor is recovering from the shock of exposure, the others are busy planning a day trip. A party was formed this evening for going on the following day to see a very fine place about 12 miles from Barton, belonging to a brother-in-law of Colonel Brandon, without whose interest it could not be seen, as the proprietor, who was then abroad, had left strict orders on that head. The grounds were declared to be highly beautiful, and Sir John, who was particularly warm in their praise, might be allowed to be a tolerable judge, for he had formed parties to visit them at least twice every summer for the last ten years. They contained a noble piece of water, a sail on which was to form a great part of the morning's amusement. Cold provisions were to be taken, open carriages only to be employed, and everything conducted in the usual style of a complete party of pleasure. To some few of the company it, it appeared rather a bold undertaking, considering the time of year, and that it had rained every day for the last fortnight, and Mrs. Dashwood, who had already a cold, was persuaded by Eleanor to stay at home. The narrator doesn't say who came up with this, but it feels like it's a plan hatched between Brandon and Sir John, the place belongs to Brandon's brother-in-law, and Sir John visits it pretty regularly, so maybe it was a shared idea. Now remember, it's October, and it has been raining every day for two weeks, so of course they decide. And by they, I mean Marianne, Willoughby, and Lady Middleton, maybe Sir John, to travel there in open carriages in order to be stylish. And if it rains, Marianne will call it romantic, and Willoughby will have a reason to drive faster. Now, I'm wondering, was Mrs. D there the whole time? Was she there while Margaret was blabbing? And if she was there, would she have stopped it? She's got a cold after all, so maybe she wasn't there that night. And maybe that's why Margaret felt more willing to talk about this. And if she wasn't there, maybe that was the reason Margaret felt so free to talk about Eleanor's love life. Regardless, next episode, we're heading to Whitwall. Maybe. Thank you for listening to Ends and Sensibility. Today's episode was written and edited by me, Casey Meserve. You can listen to all the episodes of Ends and Sensibility on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please share and subscribe and leave a review. Those reviews really help other people find this podcast. You can write to me at endsandsensibility at gmail. And you can follow Ends and Sensibility on Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. And if you'd like to purchase any of the books that we've mentioned on the show in the past, check out the bookshelf page on ensinsensibility.com. We also have show notes on every show and so much more. Thank you, have a lovely day, and I hope you'll visit again soon. Mm-hmm.